Welcome to Turn a Page, the official comic book club for Nerd Initiative. Each week, the NI Bullpen will be covering the world of comics, talking to creators, deep diving into some fantastic stories, and much more. Now let's hand it over to the team and turn a page. And what is going on, everyone? It is Tuesday night, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and you are tuned in to Nerd Initiative YouTube for another edition of Turn a Page, the official comic book club on Nerd Initiative. My name is Ken M. You know me as the host of the ODPH podcast. I'm also Nerd Initiative Editor-in-Chief. Finally back in studio to my left. You're right at home. He does his own intro because it's in his contract. Come and at your live and direct straight from the ODPH studio. My name is Off the Cuff Tom, Nerd Initiative's pop culture connoisseur, Ken Lawrence. Kyle, always a pleasure. Absolutely. And joining us for this edition, you know her as one half of the dynamic duo of drafts and dialogue, bringing you that pop culture knowledge that you need to know each and every single week. And if we're talking about comics' fastest growing universe, Minor Threats by Dark Horse Comics, you know that she is going to be in attendance for it. Please welcome the one and only Lauren from Hops Geeks News. Ooh, I can never follow Tom. It's never as good, but I'm super happy to be here. Yes, I've been loving this world from the beginning, and I got to say, uh, Shit Eater is my new favorite character. Sorry, Crab Louie. You were, I still love you. But... <laughs> Shit Eater, just, he, he moved to the top so fast. I fell in love right away. I'm going to take it, but I'm soft on Crab Louie, man. He's a good one. Crab Louie's a good one. Crab Louie's great. And joining us, too, to talk about this, there's a brand new spinoff from this universe, from the world of minor, minor threats, known as Barfly. And we are fortunate enough to have the writer of this book on. And you know his work from such book as, books as I Hate This Place from Skybound and Image Comics, Lobo Cancellation Special coming up from DC Comics, and one of my favorite series out of this year, Pine and Merrimack from Boom Studios. Please welcome to the show the one and only Kyle Starks. Kyle, what's going on? I don't know. We're here to talk about stuff. I'm here to do it. I'm here to talk about stuff. That's what's going on. And you know what? We are always here to talk about comics, especially great ones like this. Hey. So let's kick it off right off the bat. How did you get involved with the world of minor threats here? Uh, yeah, that's a half good story. That's a half good story. Um, so Patton and Patton Oswald and Jordan Bloom were, uh, they love promotion. They were doing their, their promotion for, I think volume two and or maybe alternates because they promote everybody's stuff and, and people were asking them who did they want to work with and they kept saying my name. So, uh, people were texting me. They're like, Hey, Patton's, Patton's talking about you on this podcast. And I was like, well, we have the same editor. So if he means it, you know, we could we could shake it out. Um, but I, I told my editor, I was like, hey, they're talking about me. And we had a meeting and they said we would like for you to come up with something for this character who exists in four panels that people seem to like. And so that's it. I did a, I gave him a pitch. They liked it. And then uh, Dark Horse was said, we think Ryan Brown's interested. And that's it. We, we didn't we didn't need a second artist. We didn't need a list. I've been wanting to work with Ryan Brown for a, a really long time. So it's, it's sort of best case scenario for me. That's the story. They wanted me. They got me. I'm purely ego driven. If you want me, <laughs> I, I, I need that validation so greatly that I'm open to it. So coming off of four panels, how is it that you did pitch this spinoff story? I mean, with everything going on and obviously with all the big names behind it, how did you pitch a story from four panels to a whole arc? I mean, that's a good question. I, I'd have to ex explain the job maybe more than what, I, what we have time for. I think the thing is, like, well, who, what does he look like? He looks to me like a little downtrodden guy who's hanging out at a bar who's wearing a punk rock jacket but doesn't look very punk rock to me. And uh, it's like, well, who is that guy? What is his story? I, I, they may have said he was an ex-henchman. Maybe. It, there was very little involvement on their end, to, to their credit, honestly. Um, in fact, in that that aforementioned meeting, um, outside of being asked, which I like very much, simply being asked goes a long way in life for anybody. But they, Patton said specifically at one point in time, because I am I'm very Type A about storytelling. He said, "I want to do these spinoffs the way I do my tour posters. I want to find artists I like and have them do what they do." So they were really hands off. They may have said he was a henchman. I can't remember, but I know for me immediately it was like, "Well, what is?" We, the whole thing about the whole minor threats is that we love this sort of, it's these familiar archetypes, it's these familiar situation, it's these familiar sort of trope characters, but to look at them from a very sort of human, like character-driven perspective. And so me going, oh, 
and we, there's a bunch of henchman stories. I'm not like, I didn't create something new. There's a lot of really good henchman stories. I mean, the Venture Brothers, look, it's right there in front of us. Right. Um, but I, I was like, I hadn't seen, I, I just thought like, what would, what is the Moloid version? <laughs> like, who, what is the Moloid version in the minor threats where he's on, those sad little guys are on their own. And, and that was sort of, sort of the beginning and sort of the end. Right on. Yeah, I think I got that. Uh, so on one hand, I knew there's, there's, for me in the story that I wanted to tell, there would be very little crossover. Um, you know, the, the continuum would, would be in play um, and we would use the bar, but it's sort of a prequel. It's sort of a prequel to volume one, which is like quietly unspoken. Um, so I knew there wasn't gonna be a lot of crossover. The biggest conversation between me and them was, I knew the continuum would exist. Um, I think we see, we see one of them in issue two, we see more of them in issue three, we see more of them in issue four, was to present them in a way that aligned with the way that those guys want them to be presented. Um, so that was sort of the only, they, they were very hands off. They were very cool. I think they're really open to anything. And, and you know, I think Jordan sort of famously says um, from his perspective is like, they want to sort of break Batman. Like what they want to do is break these characters. So it's still the archetype you know, and like, I love tropes. So it's like, there's something very powerful about you going, oh, I recognize this character is parentheses Superman. So when parentheses Superman is very mad at parentheses uh, leapfrog, right? <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's a really interesting story because what is leapfrog going to do? Um, and so that was their sort of thing, but they were very hands off. They're very cool. They were like, as a creator um, who was making themselves open to work on someone other's IP, someone else's IP, uh, they were very cool. And I know Tim Seeley said that said the same thing. Um, they they want to work with people they like and they trust them. And that's huge. Like that's huge and it's smart if you want to tell good stories. Absolutely. Uh, so the art in this is very uh, extreme and next level art. Uh, so one of my questions, because obviously when you're reading it, you're getting a whole other story in the background. The posters, the mm -hmm. signs, just even the tears of unemployment, all of that. So um, obviously you're an artist as well. So how much of that was just Ryan Brown's own thing and how much of that was actually part of the script? Um, if it's a sound effects, it's probably Ryan Brown. If it's something in the background, um, I know I was talking to someone earlier and they're like, oh, I love all these punk rock posters in the background. Um, I definitely wrote, put some punk rock posters in the background, right? Um, Ryan, dude, Ryan's is really special. If you guys haven't read 8 Billion Genies, I think it's one of the best books of the last five years, if not the last 10 years, if not the last, I mean, like, I think it's an iconic work. And it's one of those books where only Ryan Brown could have drawn that book. And I yeah, fully agree. That he does. Yeah, there's, dude. I, I I say repeatedly, and I'm sure at this point it, it sounds, it sounds like uh, disingenuous, but to Ryan, but to me, this book it for on his behalf is a relentless display of creativity. It's just every panel he put a second joke in. Every panel has at least one other joke. I wrote this, um, and to in regards to our relationship, Ryan has said that I write a script with the information that I would need to draw, that Kyle would need to draw it. And so he gets it right away. Like it's exactly what he needs to know what each panel looks like. Um, but you let Ryan be Ryan. Um, and I found like, you never know. The first issue is kind of a, a feeler, like you, to decide how you're gonna sort of, you might have to change how you write depending on how they tell a story or, and for Ryan it was just like, oh, I'm just gonna have to let him go. Like mm -hmm. you just have to be ready that he is going to go so hard at this. I wrote the scripts, we get pencils, I see the pencils. I then see the inks and then I see the colors and then I see it again with letters and I it not doing a bit. I found something new every single time. Every single time I found something new in the background and I'm sitting, I'm like, why is, I'm like, why is this guy got Limerita cans everywhere? <laughs> it's like such a funny little thing. And the, the thing that's really interesting about Ryan that outside of being like, and I think, I think Abel Genius is gorgeous. I think this book is, I, I'm going to say selfishly, I think it's the best drawn thing he's done in a while. It's so creative and it's so strong and he's such a good storyteller and he makes such good decisions. I mean, this is a this is a character that does not talk, that cannot emote. He doesn't have eyes that can blink. He doesn't have a smile. Like, and Ryan is killing it. I know he said that he's drawing it like it's a silent movie. Um, and I think it completely comes across that way. 
to the the problems that he solved just from an artistic standpoint of trying to represent a character who can't emote is mm -hmm. he does it it's amazing and you can see like how the character becomes more and more rubbery like as it goes along because he's like well i'm leaning into it. it's like yeah lean into it um so i would love to take credit I mean, certainly I'm directing a story. He is, he is following the script, but all those Easter eggs, I think in issue two, I was like, here's a couple. And like, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to, like, I'm not going to do this. Like right. he's got, he's got this. I don't need to do this part for him. But the thing is to me, when I look at this book um, from someone who is an artist, like Ryan likes to draw, like he really likes to draw. And I think it shows in this book. And for someone who does it, but doesn't like to do it as much, like, it's it's kind of a beautiful thing to sort of like get to experience uh, as he does it. Look at those great bugs. Yeah, what the detail he puts in on this is just absolutely mind blowing. Yeah, and like you yeah. really get that sense of just like every page has got so many little things in here that you that as a reader watching it, you just can't help but do a couple reads just because you know you missed something. And that's mm -hmm. I mean that's a testament yeah. to. It you know the great art that ryan's doing on this yeah and especially the creative freedom that you talked about was there any idea that you guys wanted to do that an editor or anybody was like ah, i don't know we should go there it was just completely free reign here's an open playbook run crazy i can't think of any time knock on wood that someone's like don't do that <laughs> i can't yet like i'm not pushing an envelope so hard i think the only originally we were maybe going to use like more like albums, like real albums, and they were like, maybe don't do that. But all that stuff's in posters, so that didn't even stick. Um, and I think, the, like, wisely, because it was like London Calling was the album, and it's, yeah. it says, it's like Britain texting. Like, some, it's so funny. He's so funny. Like, all that's, that's Ryan. It's all, I'd love to take credit for, like, all the, any, if it's a visual gag, I probably had nothing to do with it. If it's a story <laughs> thing, then I did that. If it's dialogue, I did that. But every shirt's different. And Ryan has said, like, he doesn't worry about continuity. He's like, no one actually cares if someone's wearing the same shirt from, so it's like, it's, read it, the next panel. It's a different joke. It's just a different joke over and over. Um, it's so impressive. I just love that. Every shirt's, there's, there's a, something with mice that he is going through the whole thing. And I don't know what it is. All right. In one of the other comics too, though, didn't they for minor threats? Yeah. Well, I think uh, there's, so, so there's uh, something that's, I know that's in the first volume, which I never would have recognized. Um, is that all the cats have extremely long tails and there's no there's no in world explanation for this but so when we had um i'm i'm not gonna remember the character's names guys i, I wrote that book a while ago but oh, the nice lady the nice lady who uh who is sort of shit eaters like landlady she has all these cats and you'll note that they have extremely long tails because that is canonical to the minor threats universe so you think at some point in time like the living tribunal like crashed and all the cats tails got longer some bizarre uh you know cosmic they experience. are yeah i was actually that was going to be one of my questions real quick just talking about the art when you described the cat lady did you have a cat on her head did you have eight no. million cats all around okay. no i wrote i i mean i wrote she was i'm sure i wrote like she's what you'd think of a nice sweet old lady with a bunch of cats like right, I, right. I wrote something like that i try not to do for character design um that's not my strength as a creator and it's usually the strength of the illustrators I don't, I don't get into that. Um, and I found with Ryan, in fact, I think it's an issue too. Again, I wrote this a while ago and they haven't sent me comps yet, those rats. Um, I said it, <laughs> they still didn't, they, they said they're not gonna send them any faster, so it doesn't matter. Is that there's a character at a bar, I think it's an issue too. Is there a weird bar character where he looks like a sleeping cat head? All right, maybe this side. There's this very weird character at a bar. <laughs> it might be an issue three. And I wrote weird character at bar. And Ryan drew like the most unhinged character, like that big I was, guy with a raccoon head. I think it was. You no, know, he's he's like a sleeping cat. It must be in three. It must be in three. And it's like, why would you do that? And he's like, he's like, you told me I could do whatever I wanted, so that's all I want to hear. And I was like, I was like, all right, I get it. So I some of that, you know, I was like, you have to be careful, because I was like, if I if I said something ridiculous, if um if I said an issue. Issue two has entomologist is a breakout, right? It has the origin of how he broke out of. Okay, sorry, I wrote them a while ago, but I know them. They're very good. Um, and I was like, oh, there's a bit where obviously, like, he would ride out sort of on a cloud of insects. Like he would, like you can envision this in your head. And but I, after, I was like, oh, Ryan will try to draw that. Like I had to write, <laughs> I had to write in a way that he wasn't going to spend like five days drawing 
millions of insects, you know? So some of that, I, I, I did protect him in some ways from himself by trying to make things easier because you, you have those guys who will do that, they'll, they'll go too far. And, and while that's great for the reader, it's not great for deadlines. So <laughs> you have to protect them sometimes. Now, because of the art and how unique all the characters are, and you already alluded to it, the entomologist is a very unique villain, to say the least. I mean, for you as a writer, what's it like trying to do this weird father-ish, son-ish, <laughs> Cinderella maid-ish you hmm. know, relationship between him and Shit Eater? Well, I'll tell you, I might have a lot of dad issues just going through all of my <laughs> I'm, uh I'm sort of... Okay. Did anybody hurt you? I mean, he's dead now. Um, so it is what it is, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of dad issue stuff. Um, you know, you, you, you write what you, you write what you know. I hate this place. I'm regularly told the scariest thing in it is the father. Peacemaker is a hundred percent, you know, daddy issues. Um, so I, uh, Mars Attacks, which I did with Chris Schweitzer, which is one of my favorite books is daddy issues. And I mean, maybe all of them are, you know, honestly, um, I'm very, I very much like the idea of family in story. I think it's something that we can all universally relate to mm -hmm. or recognize. Like e either you long for it or you experienced it, right? And so I'm, that's something that I go back to again and again and again because I think it's universal and I think stories should be universal. So is it, I mean, it's, it's like my eighth shitty dad. Like that's the only answer I have for you. Um, I'm, I'm, I'll try to write a shitty mom in the future. I just can't imagine. Mine was so good. I have such a good mom. It's hard to imagine a bad mom. But uh, you know, I, like my first like five books all had Hitman in them. And my wife was like, "When are you going to do a book that doesn't have Hitman in it?" And I was like, "Okay, I get it." And then last year, every book I did had a dog in it, or had a character named Wild Dog in it, which is basically just like having a dog in it. And I was like, "I need to maybe do less dogs." And I did Who Woofs the Wolfman for DC. And uh, I was like, no, I'm gonna no more dogs. I'm gonna take like three books off, no dogs. So maybe I need to take a break from uh, bad dads too. It's very possible. Just get to a dozen and then you know call take a break. I think you know like I, we always you always want to write things that people can relate to. I think and and I know I I would like to hope that most people have good dads, but I think like bad dads and bad bosses are share the sort of same sort of like you know uh, it's an area where they hold power over you in a way that is sort of you're helpless to, but if you overcome, whether, you know, mentally, spiritually, or whatever, like, I think it's a very rewarding experience to sort of watch happen. Um, Shit Eater's got a bad dad. He, and I, he's the, he's, he doesn't even like consider himself his dad, which is worse, because he's definitely his dad. Like, it's even shitty, he's even worse. Yeah. Like, poor Shit Eater doesn't have anything. He literally has nothing. He's got <laughs> the been... oh. He's got yeah, great got... friends, though. He does have a great- I, Let's hope yeah. so. No, yeah, Anthony's he's kidding. They're good. He's got he's got good friends. Yeah, he's got he's got he's, he's got people looking out for him. But man, it's tough to be that little guy. It's tough to be that little guy. You gotta love a good work for him. Tough to be a bud. Oh yeah. No, the, I mean the fact the band is getting together about this. I mean that's just one key element of this whole story too. And I would say in this world of minor threats, because we're dealing with you know traditional villains, so to speak. How important was it yeah. to establish Shit Eater as a good guy? Because he almost seems like he's too good to be bad, even though he's trying to be. It's funny, like I, but he he does do two robberies in the first issue. I think the thing with Shit Eater is he's trying to find if he's good or bad, right? Because he's always been by if only by relationship bad, right? Because yeah. his dad is bad, um, and you know he like Bertrand, like Bertrand's the giant beetle, his giant beetle friend. Like he's good too. I think that they both sort of share that relationship of like. Um, like you know, working for like a really like a, well, we know that we know it's evil, but like we have to pay the bills. I think they sort of they sort of existed in that together. But I think for Shit Eater, a lot of this story, they Jordan and Patton called it a, uh, a henchman coming of age story, which I think is really great. I think it's a really like beautiful way to sort of to sum up what the book is. All four issues when you finish, you know, is that he's trying to figure out like is he good or is he bad. Is he he's is he his father's son? Is he a good loyal boy, or has he been out of the game long enough to be like I don't know? Like maybe I wasn't. Maybe everything I was taught is wrong, and I think that's really what you see. So those sort of early like he needs work. What is he good at? He's always been a henchman. He's always been a henchman. So if someone says let's let's make money, solve all your problems, you just have to hench one more time. I'm sure he does it, but I think like you know the guitar like he he am I spoiling anything? It's been out for a while, guys. Go buy it. Um, yeah. Seriously, please. It, um, <laughs> is that I think I think it, it. Uh, 
is that I think I think that's what it is. It's him figuring out who he is. And the thing is, though, he he's he loves his he loves entomologists. Entomologists created him, and and he sees him as a father. Like he imprinted on him as a father. So he he's going through all those motions too of of wanting to get sort of the validation from this person about how bad they are. Um, and so we see is like where how does it end? Gosh, I can't wait to find out. I bet it all turns out great for a character named Shit Eater. I bet it doesn't get worse. I bet each issue doesn't get worse each time. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Well, I mean, you do see some parallels with Frankie because it's the same kind of thing with this, you know, they're just raised to be the specific thing and whether it's good or bad, that's all they know. And when you're told like, this is what you are your whole life, it's hard to switch that. And what I love about the whole minor threats world in general is that these quote unquote villains don't necessarily come across as the villains and some of the heroes do. So I, I love just the this skewed yeah. perspective and seeing all of these terrible parents. That's what I feel like all of it is just such skewed perspective. Not your perspective is such a good choice of words because I think though they are doing crimes, like they are doing bad. I just like it, what is a, if if we lived in a world where there was villains, like what defines that? It's, is it what they do? Is it what they believe? And I think those guys, like I do, and I would I'll speak for Tim Seeley too. Just think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting to explore. Whereas like even if you rob people, I mean, look at um, you know, like the the Flash Rogues Gallery. Like they do awful things, but they're not. I think you would let them probably babysit your kid you know what i mean like you trust them to like with your pets probably <laughs> tom's like i don't know i i don't know all the lore i don't know all the lore <laughs> at least at least captain cole well i mean I'll, they, they, they I, have a code amongst them like, that, that's yeah. one thing that keeps them in check and but you kind of see that in parallels and minor threats too like mm -hmm. there's the kind of like you know the quote-unquote honor amongst thieves right you see that play out too and especially how the roles are reversed because you have the villains like you touched upon they are considered the good guys at some point because obviously the heroes are a little more skewed to, uh, you know, dare we say, like the boys rather than the Justice League in this kind of. Yeah, yeah no, I, I don't think that's accurate. You know, if you look at volume, that, this is what I think is interesting is like one. You know, I don't know if Minor Threats is selling as well as it should be, which maybe I shouldn't say outright. Which in a time that we're sort of like this deconstructionist meta superhero thing is so popular, I think Minor Threats does it incredibly well and in an incredibly unique way. I mean, I believe this firmly. I wouldn't do it if I didn't like that first volume. But the thing is, like, I don't. If, if you look at the continuum and you go, oh, they're like the boys, they're not. They're good guys. Mm -hmm. But Batman had a bad day. That's what that first volume is, is that yeah. Batman, the the one who is walking the line, got pushed past it. And who's going to suffer is all those, you know, his gallery, his rogues gallery, right? So when you see, like, um, I'm blanking on Searcher. When Searcher shows up, she's tough on Frankie. She's not evil. When she's chasing them, she's not evil. When you see her in alternatives, like, kind of a bad leader but she's not evil and so the thing is like from their perspective and he's murdering everybody so he is evil i mean like yeah. i can't think of what the batman's called which is such a bad thing because i should know but he crosses the line you know what i mean like he crosses the line and so that's what you see and these guys are in survival mode like everyone's in survival mode so had they robbed like the snake guys have definitely killed people you know what i mean like snake guys definitely killed people the doctors couples definitely killed people so it's like they're not good but in this case, they're in the right, and we always respect survival, right? Like, we always go, well, people have the right to live, if anything. Um, I think it's so interesting, and it's so clever, and I, I think it's, I hope it's true of Barfly, but I think it's true of Alternatives and, you know, Minor Threats 1. It's, like, it's very clever, it's very smart, it's, it's something that I think if people who like mainstream comics would really like, they do it really well. It's something that will, that will feel familiar but it's unique and it's smart and it's character driven. And I think maybe the big two have sort of stepped too far away from being character driven um, in 2024 to make new readers. So I think it's exciting that someone's sort of exploring these things. I can't wait to see um, the brute. I can't wait to see uh, the Mike Allred, Mac Fraction wingman story. Like there's so many cool things that are coming and I just feel remiss. Like I think people might be sleeping on it more than they should because of Patton's name on it, I assume. I don't know. Like their alternates is so smart and so good, uh, and such a good idea. Oh, and the twist at the end—that was. It's crazy. such a good idea to go. What if? What if Animal Man and Swamp Thing before they got Vertigo and then after they got Vertigo? That's so smart. Like, yeah. What? What's it like to be Swamp Thing when you're a god for five years and then you're not? Then you're just a weird swamp guy. That's so smart. It's so interesting. Uh, I just think all the minor threats books are good, and 
I'm happy to be part of it. I hope I'm not letting anyone down. I think we're doing okay. I think Ryan's doing great. No, I think I think for what everything you guys have been doing, and, and to kind of touch upon something you mentioned in there, you're seeing a lot more resurgence in doing more character-driven stories and a lot of the different lines that are coming out right now. You think it's just a, a matter that the creators really want to get back to that kind of basics? Because like you touched upon, the big the big two have kind of stepped away from that a little bit. Um, I mean, I can't I can't speak to a publisher's intent. You know what I mean? Um, I think. Uh, this is a whole conversation. This is a whole can of worms that maybe I don't want to get into. Sorry, I'll, sorry. Say, I'll say this. Here's what I'll say, and I'll try to be brief. Um, I'm in the point where I'm being offered big two books, right? And I worked in a comic shop until, let's say, 98, from when I was 14 years old to I was like 22. And then I moved on, and I came back to comics when I was in my mid to late 30s, direct market comics. Mm -hmm. And I don't know where those guys, like the guys that I liked in 1998 aren't those guys anymore. They've had whole lives you know i like they're just different people so when people ask me uh someone name a character any character what any character doesn't matter who it is batman Green wolverine. Wolverine. So they're, okay they're like hey we want you to pitch on wolverine i'm researching wolverine i'm going to marvel unlimited and i'm reading the last 15 years right and what i found in my own personal experience which is not denigrating the writers at all because the writing is the stories are dope they're mm -hmm. dope stories huge stakes the way that these guys can unfold stakes and danger is unbelievable to me. But as I was reading these to try to find these characters, I found they just assume you know these characters. Like they will say their name, they will say their power, they will not say why we like them. Like they will not say like why I, as a forty-seven-year-old man, have always liked Wolverine. Like they, there's none of that. The, and Wolverine's kind of an exception because he's one of those characters that everything about him is baked in. Um, and I think if you look at the characters that sort of persevered in terms of sales and popularity, they're characters who their personality, their character is part of everything they are. Superman, Batman, Spider-Man, we'll say Wolverine too. You know who they are. Every action they do is them, right? But like Storm, like you have to, like Storm's dope. You have to tell people why Storm's dope. You have to let us see her be dope rather than just, oh, she's really powerful now and she's in charge. It's like, but yeah, she's dope though. Like you guys know. So I feel like in 2024 when I don't think that, as an industry, the big two, I'm saying direct market comics, I'm saying specifically big two lead the way. That's just how it is. Right. Um, you guys, yeah. I'm not saying, is that, I think they have, it's very much like, well, you guys know, here's a new thing. And I think like, if you think like why we love comics is because we saw them as people. And I don't think they're that as much anymore. So I think going very character driven, I think it's smart. Even if you only like, we're going to do it for this long. I think the black label stuff does a good job of it. Mm -hmm. of going, Like this is why we like these characters. Um, but I think it's going to be tough to, I think it's tough to make new readers if you're not constantly going like why these characters are likable, not that they're doing cool things, though we love them to do cool things. So certainly, and I say that because I have a bias because that's what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I want that to be the way, <laughs> the most successful form of comics, but like Barfly is a character driven story, Pine and Merrimax, all of it, it's all character driven. Um, and I'm better at that. I'm better at character than I am, you know, plot points. I don't think anyone's ever go, what a, what a very clever story he did. Um, but I think it'll be a good story with people that you want to spend time with. And I think that's what comics should be. Um, no, I, I think that's a great analogy too. Cause like, that's what, you know, that's how I got into reading is like, I really got hooked with the characters and especially now seeing this, it just seems like there is a big push for that now, which I'm loving because like right now there's so many great books on the indies and you're starting to see a big push of that too that it's now getting people involved and like we're seeing how these projects are going to the small screen and big screen in certain degrees but it all kind of stems back to where it all began and that's the comic shops and that's these characters that we're going and falling in love with so to speak on wednesdays every week yeah i agree give me the character i want them to get pizza that's, give me two pages of them just ordering pizza <laughs> and arguing about it how wants pineapple on it why is how want pineapple on it it's fucking how <laughs> but it's true even with some tv shows it's like some of your favorite moments in shows like the walking dead and game of thrones are sometimes those those down you know it's little key moments, moments the, yeah the it's humanity. always humanity moments all the other stuff makes you go wow they're cool but it's the humanity uh like there's a reason why daryl was like the most daryl dixon is that what is that right yeah like why he was the most popular he there's yeah. a reason why he was written he was written as that guy you know what i mean and I feel like there's a balance between that. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying like I'm better than anyone else. Um, but I think we should want to spend time with these people. And sometimes you have to remind, if you look at manga, like manga is all character. When you come in, like they're selling it out and there's same, it's archetype, 
but the archetypes are characters. You know what I mean? Like they're not like, oh, that's Superman. You go, oh, that's the horny one, which was a bad example, but you know what I mean? And to have those sort of click out things, you go, oh, I like that guy. I like that guy. When I see that guy, I like that guy. But you know what you're getting into and they don't, they never stop reminding you. And I think that's why manga is flourishing so well because those young people are us. 30 years ago, or younger for you guys probably, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> like, I think that they, they're getting character, whereas we failed to sort of give them character for, for many years. And I'm not saying that because um, the industry is doing well. Like, what do I know? Like, I'm in an unfinished basement. Look how smart this guy is. Um, but I like I like characters. Yeah. I don't even have to. You know what I mean? Like, I like, uh, I like characters, and that's like movies. I think all of it, it's, it's very rarely that people go, well, that was cool when that thing blew up and you didn't care about the guy who blew up, you know what I mean? Right. I just feel like we've kind of missed that, but you're also talking like what, 75 years of us selling, you go, well, they know who, they know who, uh, I, I love a minor, they know who Leapfrog is. It's like, they don't, they have no idea. Like no one, no one, no one knows why we like speedball. Like you have to tell them why we like speedball. You have to show them speedball has to do stuff. And mm -hmm. I think TV, TV has gotten very good at that at being very good character driven. And I think, Manga is very good at that, um, which is not to say like it's anything's better or worse than other. But I like man, whenever I read something, I'm like, dude, there's none. Like uh, Beast obviously is a bad example because he's changed so much. But like, I'm, like if it was if it was 1998 and Beast didn't make a joke, you'd be like, what is this? Right. Like, what, right. Is, what is this horse shit? Like, why they could have been anyone? It could have been anyone. We like you put the Beast in there, give me the Beast stuff, and I feel like that's where we're at now in many ways. And I don't read everything, so I can't speak. I can't speak to that, but uh, right. So, well, with minor threats coming to Netflix, I'm sure there will be an increase in in viewership with the comics. But I, you know, anybody who hasn't gotten into this, like, get into the mm -hmm. world now because it's so much more fun when you're in it from the ground up. When you get to, you know, watch the show and do that Leonardo DiCaprio moment, like, hey, that shit eater. Ooh. So, I mean, yeah, there's no better time than the present. And now you have a good. If you're one of those people that likes to wait till you have a few issues, like I get that. Like, there's Man, plenty I out now. There's you know, 12 issues and now these yeah. two, four I say issues. objectively, volume one of Minor Threats and, and the alternates are so much fun. If you like superhero comics, if you like superhero comics, they're so good. You'll really enjoy it. It's something you haven't seen before. And maybe you've seen something similar. It's not done as well. It's And I say that without hyperbole. It's really fun. And I think I just can't believe they stopped are going because you know kids are coming in or asking for Boys and Invincible. It's like, oh, if you like those, you should check out. It's literally, like, I, I put them all in that same vein is that they're sort of... There's, they're sort of very yeah. fun, if uh, f depending on what your idea of fun is. But like, they're very fun sort of deconstruction uh, superhero stuff. And I, I've always liked that. We all have. Like, that's why we like, you know, Dark Knight Returns. And that's why we like The Watchmen, is that we love mm -hmm. seeing these things in a different light. Right. And The Fastest Way Down had, like, an element of, like, mobster stuff. So what's really cool, too, is we're just getting different pictures of this world. And, like, Barfly, I feel like, is the more almost like lighthearted version of it, even though these terrible things are happening, it's still more of like a lighthearted fun part of the it's a romp. world. We're having a little romp. I like that word. Yeah. <laughs> I think comics, I use romp a lot because I think that's what they should be. That's not to say all like they shouldn't all be, they should not be funny. You know what I mean? But I think you should go, I'm glad I was here for this. That was a, a nice little ride that we went on. No, I fully agree yeah. about that. I mean, that's the whole thing. You should be time. enjoying comics. I mean, that's just it's it's just another way for everybody to go celebrate the the medium. Because, I mean, where else do you get the chance to really run with the creativity other other than the comic medium? I mean, that's just how I take it. Yeah. So the world of minor threats is clearly not going anywhere because we've all we're talking about how excited we are. We got the Netflix coming. I mean, it's it's got to keep going. Yeah. It's too good to not keep going. So my question, uh, and you may not be able to answer this, but I'm not even going to ask if I'm going to ask when will we see Shit Eater again after this issue, and it will it be more than him just sitting yes, on a bicycle in the background? Yes, we are about this. That's <laughs> I, I I do not I do not I have no idea I have no idea. Um, Ryan Ryan just That's announced fair. his next book with Charles Soule. Every, he he would be um i'm not trying to throw ryan under the bus either but ryan's a deciding factor like ryan would be a deciding factor for us if we did more i know that um i have been offered to do more uh to do something else um kind of coming after ryan is like sort of such a letdown you know what i mean like yeah. it's hard to follow up something when when you get to work with ryan brown and he brings so much but I love, I love, like I said, I, I, I think I've shown, I love this deconstruction stuff. I think it's great. So 
I'm very interested. I where Barfly be? He'll be in the background, probably right where he's happy, uh, hanging out, just walking silently, <laughs> walking silently in one panel per pay, per issue. Um, supposedly, he's going to be in the Netflix deal, but we'll see. We'll see. And at that point, that's Scott Hepburn's. That's not even my. That's not even my shit eater. That's Scott Hepburn's. You know, he's the one who created him. So it's like if he shows up in Netflix, like that's a celebration of of Scott Hepburn, and and he deserves you know all the flowers for that. Um, all the character design. I mean, literally almost all the character design is Scott Hepburn. Um, I don't know how completely that is true of the alternates, but I know for us, if it wasn't a new character, it was Scott Hepburn's character design, and and he was very hands on with that, which was great. Now we know that that's Scott's baby, Barfly. But mm -hmm. if you had your choice, who would you fan cast to voice Shittier? Oh, Pat Oswalt. But he doesn't talk. But I, it has to be Pat Oswalt. <laughs> it has to be Pat Oswalt. But I always assume he's making noises. Right. Like cool. I was gonna, I, I'll tell you this because I, 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 hey, Pat, if you're watching, I'm sorry. But I was gonna do the bit because like he's, there's kind of a, a thing. <laughs> he's probably not. He's very busy. Um, of like, is because like there was a, when I first started and there was like, it's like is his name Barfly or is it Shit Eater? So I was, I was like, maybe I'll do a subplot where he's kind of like trying to figure out a name. And I was like, wouldn't it be funny if he chose the name Patton? I did not do that. I did not do that. But I thought it would have been really funny. And so I will confess to it now. So I think I think it should be like if there's gonna be a voice for an animated character and in minor it should be Patton. Of course it should be Patton. Yeah, he's gotta yeah. have a cameo in there somewhere. My idea completely yeah. out because Patton Oswald wins. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Who's a who's a shit who's a shit eater? I, so actually, I, I do know an actor who has voiced a fly in Power Ranger lore, and we're just gonna leave it. Oh, <laughs> well, that's a good one. But no, I think, Patton, a, I think Patton has that particular grit that he could. Uh, lend to the character as opposed to my guy. Now, because of Barfly and because of all the great little nods and Easter eggs, um, as much as I might look like uh, Tom generic, you know, middle management guy right now, I do love good old punk rock. What are some albums that would be in Barfly's playlist? And on top of it, what are some in your playlist while you're writing? Hey, you put me, you put me on the spot. We did a Spotify, a Spotify. Now listen, not even better. Spotify. Not, not on purpose. Uh, we did a That's perfect. When I say we, Patton and I did a punk rock playlist, uh, Spotify Barfly playlist um, that you can find. I, I think it's called Barfly, um, and it's. I would say it's basically sort of a starter's guide <laughs> to punk rock. Um, I am a solid twenty-five years away from being punk rock. I know for him and I, I said, um, and it's a good list. It's a good list. You put me on the spot because I was—I didn't know I had to talk about punk rock music today, um, and I'm a little bit—I have to—I have to kind of go back to my roots a little bit. But I know for that, I was like, "Hey, I really want to put um, Bastards of Young by Replacements on here, which is not a true punk rock song, but I think is kind of the most punk rock song." And he was like, "Yeah, put it on there." And he has another one like that that's escaping me. Um, and I know like Rebel Girl by Bikini Kill. I'm trying to think of what is on there that I'm like, I really love. But like we wanted to make sure we covered all of our bases too. So it's a it was a little bit um uh what's the word? Is a little bit more studied and technical than maybe like us just putting like our favorite things. Cause it's like if you're gonna put um like you know, we're putting the Ramones on there and it's like, well, it's gonna be it's gonna be probably I wanna be sedated, but there's like a million possibilities. So um yeah, I'm much, my wife says I'm much more rural than rock now, and that's a fair assessment. Um, but I also think, like, I think that the punk rock element for this is very much, like I was saying earlier, with him sort of being very young and trying to find his way. And it's like him and I don't know his friends. I'm so bad. I usually read things. I usually reread things so I know characters' names before I do these. His friend who works at the, uh, the, bite, the burger bite with him, who plays okay. drums, who's what's there at the band. He, they're both like, he, he's like, I'm a punk rocker, but he's not, which I think is great. Um, but they very much believe in the tenets, like the basic philosophies. And so that's really, I think what he's taking away is like, we should look at authority in a certain way. And that's what draws uh, uh, Barfly to it. Maybe more than like, you know, who are your top three punk rock bands? Uh, yeah. Johnny oh, Cash is number, Johnny Cash right is number one. You know, I'm just kidding. We love Johnny. Johnny Cash is the most punk rock. It's a good list. It's a really good list. And if you, we could go through, I'll tell you which one Patton picked and which ones I picked. We were the only two who did it. Just me and Patton. That's how cool we are. Very hip. No, but it definitely works. Tom actually and has it called up right now. He's, it. he's got a big old shit-eating grin on his face right now, too. <laughs> shit-eating. 
uh, yeah. The Clash, Bad Religion, Descent, is Bikini Kill, Black Flag, Vandals. Yes. This is my childhood. It's, it's a classic. classic. It's literally a classic. And then like, there's like, uh, I think like he has like Pair Ubu on there, like Pat put Pair Ubu. So there's a couple of sneaky little good ones in there. Um, the Stooges, my God. It's a good one. Oh, yeah, Johnny no, send me a link for that. No, because I mean, like I guess <laughs> that, that's something kind of, it represents even the Minor Threats universe. Like for what everybody's doing with their books, I mean, it's very DIY and it's very, you know, driven to really build this universe into something too, which I mean, that's why, no but no pun intended, there's a lot of buzz behind this. We're just talking to readers online. Like we, and yes, you know, I hope so. Yeah, no, we like, we have the, you know, the conversations going on and this universe, like every time we recommend this, we'll have, somebody hit us up after one of Lauren's reviews, or we've actually done minor threats as uh, an addition to turn a page. And we've actually had the pleasure of talking to Jordan Patton and Scott on here. <clears throat> we've had listeners or readers come or hit us up and say, like, we're really interested in this universe. And like, I think that's something that every time we've recommended it, we've always had somebody hit us back and say like, this is really good. Yeah. We're kind of regretting that they didn't get started on this sooner. Like I saw Megan from vigilante vibes popped in there and said, I really need to get in on this too and just yeah. hearing about it but that's just one thing that just translates through is just the creativity that comes with this and with mixed in with great characters it's nothing but a win-win combination hey we love to hear it we're trying real hard yeah so oh yeah it's I'm absolutely sorry. working so that being said for the rest of 2024 <laughs> what do you have coming out that we should be looking for yes uh uh 2024 i have uh this month lobo cancellation special which is a one shot it comes out september 26th with kyle hotz and uh daniel Brown colored it. I think the colors did an unbelievably good job. Look at that cover. Um, it's the main. Man. It's really good. If you like Lobo, um, I think if you like Peacemaker, you'll like it. If you like Lobo historically, I think it. I did right by that character. Um, they're both big dummies who like violence, so it only makes sense that I'd be good at both of them. Um, so that's coming out September 26th, and then in October, the second volume of Where Monsters Lie, which was my sold out series, also from Dark Horse, um, about a gated community for slasher villains. Uh, that starts October 26th, and I believe that's it for 2024, but no one ever tells me when things are coming out, so we could be surprised at any minute by something I forgot about. Uh, I know I know, Oni's got an announcement that's coming soon. I know next year there's a big announcement from DC that I'll be a part of. Um, nice. Could they be sooner? What do I know? I don't, I don't even have comps of these things. Do you think they tell me anything? I don't know when the Pine and Merrimack trade's coming out at some point. Um, which I'm very excited about. That's something that, that I adored doing, and I adored working with Frank Galan over at Boom on that series. I think yeah. that's it. When you had Karate <laughs> Prom came out this year, and that's one that's PG. If you got any kids out there, that's a great Cobra Kai music. Yeah, we had the uh, Rock Candy Mountain was recollected into one edition, which pleases me to no end. Um, something else, something else. What else do you got, Kyle? Gosh darn it. I don't know. <laughs> stuff's, happen stuff's happening. Stuff's happening. No, but that's, I mean. Yes. It, it, listen, it, what a what a, privilege, what a place of privilege I'm in. Is like, I don't know. There's a lot out there. Who knows when it's coming out? Uh, <laughs> like, like, how lucky am I? But there's a lot. I but I think I think this, compared to last year, I was extremely, there's a lot coming out last year. I pulled back a little bit this year for mental health um, and hoping next year is going to be very busy again. Uh, I might do a Kickstarter the end of this year, the very end of this year, but probably early 2025. I think 2025, 2024, as much as I had still four or five books come out, it's like my rest year. Um, so we're, we're gearing up for 2025 where I have a bunch of stuff coming out. No, that's awesome here. Any upcoming conventions? Uh, I'm doing Memphis about? Comic Con, um, Memphis Comic Expo, I'm sorry, in October. That's a really nice regional show. They have a really good list. In fact, Kyle, the aforementioned Kyle Hotz, who I've never met before, will be doing that show also. Um, right. probably the only time we'll be together, I bet, because I don't think he's from around here. And that's the end of this year. I'm not doing New York. I got COVID last year. I can't do it. Um, I'm doing a small regional show in Owensburg, Kentucky, which is really nice. And I think, once again, I who knows? I'd have to look at my calendar. I think that's it. Um, I got COVID. I was like, I'm not going to do any big shows this year because I got COVID last year at New York Comic Con. And um, I, that I listen, I know it's bad for everyone and I don't think I had it that bad, but I was like, I can't do that. I can't do that again anytime soon. So I would go back to the big shows next year. Um, I was, they just didn't, no one seemed to care last year at those shows. You know what I mean? Listen to Kyle with this hot, Kyle starts with this hot takes. Like there was no like sanitizer out and there was no, I'm like, man, we're asking for it. And Kyle got it. So if 
if no one's going to look out for me, I have to look out for myself. But I like doing those shows. I like seeing the people. I'm hoping, you know, every year I get a little bit bigger. Um, and so, you know, we hope each year more people want to see me. And I want to see them. I don't want them not to get a chance to see me. And what a good fun time we'll have chit-chatting and exchanging money for goods. That's my favorite part. And <laughs> signing signing books to be flipped on eBay. We love it. We're here for it. Uh, <laughs> So next year, hopefully, we get back to it. I, Pre-pandemic, I did 36 shows. The wow. year before the pandemic, I did 36 shows. And I've kind of done 24 That's plus awesome. for a long time. So I was kind of due to take a little break. I was kind of due to take a little break. Um, so we just, we'll just do, we just did the home shows this year. It's like Heroes Con in Memphis and Lexington. And and that's great because you also want yeah. to support those local cons. As well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, every con has got new fans that are going to come mm -hmm. in and hear about the stories that you're doing. And that's always just the connection there because New York can always get overwhelming too. I mean, we've gone down for mm, yeah. years now and it's just, it's, it's an experience. If I know Lauren's yeah. going for the first time this year. Yeah. I've never been it's, um, this year. It's, Some. it's, it's very challenging to prepare for it and to do. That's my only knock against it. Yeah, I will say this New York comic con is one of the few shows where you're on that artist alley floor and everyone likes comics. Everyone's stoked about comics. Um, and even though it's a lot and it's sort of overwhelming, that's the best. I just did Trivicon for the first time this year in Connecticut. And it was that, and it's the best. The show I did before Connecticut, uh, Trivicon, highly recommend it. Heroes Con, Trivicon are my favorite shows. Well, not my favorite, but I like them a lot because people are like, oh, we know comics. We came to talk about comics. But the show I did before Trivicon, mm -hmm. the first person asked me how I got permission to print the comics. So you're like, it's going to be a long weekend, my guys. And yeah. indeed, it was a yeah. long weekend. So we yeah. like it when people like comics. NYCC is good. It's a lot, but it's very overwhelming. I just feel like I, they, we should have had a mask. I don't know. I, I, I don't know what I think they should have done. I, I'll do it next year. And you know, my one of my friends was like, well, how much... How much money is was it worth getting sick for? And I was like, I didn't make that much. <laughs> like not this year. This year I didn't make that number. <laughs> Whatever that number is, where I'm allowed to be sick for three months, it didn't happen. Oh. I remember a lot of comic creators posting on Twitter. That I know like right three after. people who weren't sick. I know three people, and one of them I roomed with Matt Kent, my good friend Matt Kent. We we roomed together, and he didn't get it. I got it, so I don't even know. Explain that. Maybe I got it from the airport. Maybe I didn't even get it from New York Comic Con. Right. Kyle, maybe you're talking trash about the wrong place. It's possible. It's possible, but I didn't, I didn't enjoy my experience, so I took a year off. I'll be back next year because I like the show. The fans are the best. When you go to those type of shows, it's the best feeling in comics. Like, it's the yeah. best feeling. Outside of, like, listen, number one is someone going, I, I, you did a good job and I liked it. You know what I mean? Like, to me, that's the best thing. But number two is, like, when to see people, and they tell you that, which is great, but then they're like, oh, I, we talk about what you like. You know what I mean? Like, that's what comics has always been when I worked at the shop when – from 14 to whatever, it's like we're talking about what we liked in comics, just like you know we have here a couple of times. You go, this is what I like, this is what I like, and you get excited. You're like, oh, if you like this, you'll like this. If you like this, you like this. Like that's the best part of comics. That's the best part of comics. That's and then number three is like, dude, this guy we, but, in New York is literally the kid in the candy store. Like he has the biggest. Like we're working, but this dude is just all bright eyed, smiles, doughy eyed, like, and it's wonderful to watch. We well, love it. Well, you know what, but it, it's. For me as a fan, because I try taking myself like in this perspective, it's my way of getting to meet the creators. Like I've been basically living vicariously through reading everybody's work that I'm like, now I get a chance to meet and say thank you and support and get that, you know, interaction. So like, yeah, I get, I get, you know, I don't want to say starstruck, but I'm like, I get like in my happy place because I'm sitting there talking with fans even and even girls, even, even standing in line, we have some of the great, yeah, you get to chit chat about, you talk about who's lying in their stuff and you're like, did you see this? That's what I'm saying. Like, as a community, when we when we talk about things with the enthusiasm that of why we got into them, I think that's what grows it. I think that's why we. I say like when when everyone in my age who was eight years old at some point was giving a, a comic in a grocery store to shut the hell up so mom could finish shopping, and whatever percentage of those kids, whatever percentage of those kids, there's something that goes off. Comics isn't for everybody, but there's a certain person who reads it and goes, "I like that. I like this thing. I like this," and. We kind of got away from that the same as but also the way we talk about things like if you see how manga kids interact it's us when we were 18 like you're like did you see like dude deathstroke do you remember when deathstroke showed up and like the jews like like oh my god like he was so cool like we were talking about that for months we we're talking about deathstroke for months um those are the comics like the great of the shows is that one i was gonna say is like it that's a unique thing to the comic experience right is like you can meet and we're happy to talk because god knows 
no one's talking to us at home, guys. We have to see you in public. My wife, I'm like, hey, do you, you want to hear? She's like, I don't want to, I don't care. And I'm like, okay, I'll go back to my hole. Um, the other thing is I was going to say is that Patton and Jordan are exactly that. They love comic creators. They think they're so cool and it's so neat. I know that they saw Mike Mignola at the Eisner's and they were like losing their stuff, which listen, we probably all would. But yeah. if they would mention, they're like, oh, I'd be like, oh, I was talking to so-and-so who's just like this guy I know. And like, oh, you know so-and-so. And I'm like, homie, you did what we do in shadows. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, come on, man. Like, it's two different worlds. This is like, it just shows two different worlds. But like, uh, but I'm tangenting because the thing is like, I think you can see like, there's a lot of dudes. And I think this is maybe why people hesitated on minor threats. This is, as I'm going a full loop, probably throwing off whatever plans you had. Is that I think it's because, oh, it's Patton's doing a, Patton's celebrities making a comic. Dude, those guys love comic books. Like, those guys made a comic book because they love comics, and this Netflix deal was not the plan. Like, point at any celebrity written comic, and I'll say 9.9 .9 out of 10 of them were written as proof of concept. Those guys did this because they wanted to make a comic book. Um, and they have said repeatedly, the reason why they did all the alternates is because they wanted to make a comic with Tim Seeley. The reason why they did Barfly is because they wanted to make a comic with Kyle Starks. Like, those guys love comics, and I think you can see that. Like, it is sincere. It resonates, um, it, yeah. Yeah. It resonates yeah, loudly. Yeah, 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 I think yeah. so, too. Yeah. Read Minor Threats, guys. It's really good. Oh, yeah. No, yeah I don't get the percentage to like, to, like, benefit from you reading it or not reading it. But if you like comics, you should read Minor Threats. It's really oh, good. No, it's on Hulu. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of nods to the comic book world and the way that like the boys, you know, mocks the comic book world. It's the same kind of thing that you get in the minor threats world. So even if you think you'll have no clue, like you'll still even have fun doing it. Like, oh, I see who they're yeah. mocking here. So it's it's a lot of it's a you lot need of to fun want standalone too. Like you don't need to read minor threats to read the alternates. You don't need to read the alternates to read Barfly. And I think maybe there's some I think there's something in the way people consume comics that they go, Oh, I haven't read minor threats, I'm not gonna read Barfly. It's like, well, no, if they just, right. no, no, just read it. You'll like it. You'll know what's going on. It's a little henchman. It's a little city henchman. That's all you need to know. You don't need to know who any of the characters are. When you see them, you will know who they are. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, yeah, you really don't at all. I mean, it's more fun, though, but yeah, you can also read them and go mm -hmm. back, and you're not any more, more or less. Yeah, confused. technically, Barfly is a prequel, so you guys can read that right now. It's fine. Yeah. What? That's true. Yeah, because you see that mm -hmm. with the bartender. You see with Frankie like, there before it, was, or mm -hmm. it goes on there, so. I mean, it just works, but it'd be, that's what I say. It's such a book that connects with everybody. And that's something like for as, me as a reader that I've been reading this for way too, like many, many years now, I should say. I, like, I still find stuff I get excited about. And Minor Threats in the Universe is built here is something that that's makes awesome. me want to go check this out. And that's, that's like awesome. the biggest thing that, you know, when you can gravitate towards and go like, okay, this stands out and this is why. And then you can get in those conversations and talk with everybody online about this or even at the shops. Like that is the, you know, it, it's su just such a, a cool thing to even spread. And now it's to see it expanding out more and you're seeing more creators still carry that vibe too. I mean, it's, it's just an amazing thing for a fan to watch, but I can only imagine as a creator. That's cool. That's nice. We like when people, people say nice things. Oh yeah. And there's nice a, things. There's nice. a lot of nice things to say about your work too. Cause like I said, it's very kind. I could, I could literally sit here and rant and rave about Pine and Merrimack, which I did check up. It's slated December is the trade. Yeah, it's late. It's very good. Dude, yeah. frankly, I'll say for Pine and Merrimack and, um, and for Barfly, the artists, on, and I've been, I've been blessed with artists. Even Kyle Hotz, look at that Lobo cover. I can't yeah. say enough. About I've been blessed with artists. Uh, Fran Galan, like I could, he, he's so good. Fran Galan's going to be a guy who's going to break. I, I cannot believe there's a world where he does not break out in some way. He's so good. I could not be on that book and it's worth getting ryan brown is the same like he's doing i could not be on there like i think i'm additive in a major way but like the art is so unbelievably good um i think that's rare that's two two really good art books if you just like uh some comic draftsmanship and two different styles too like two completely Very different good. ways to sort of approach it yeah. um both of those guys would work with repeatedly repeatedly yeah and like i say if you if, and if anybody hasn't checked that out like seriously go get pine and merrimack I could literally talk for another hour about that book because I just think it's absolutely incredible, especially the ending, which I'm not spoiling. That's what I'm saying. You got to get to your comic shops and go pick this up. Yes. Along with Karate Prom, we haven't really talked about that quickly, but I know that is a book that Lauren has had the chance to interview, talk with you about. Do you want to tell our audience about that a little bit? Oh, you want to know what it's about? Yep. It's about a Karate Prom. Let's oh. keep it, moving, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's in the name. It's a yeah. Karate Prom. It's, uh, it's all ages. I'd say it's all ages. PG's. PG's part, PG thirteen, maybe, maybe. There's no curse words or anything, but they do punch each other. 
It's about a karate prom. I don't know what to tell you. Do you like do you like eighties movies? Do you like karate? There you go. Karate prom. It's right there. It's right there for you. Bam. It really is like Cobra Kai meets Scott Pilgrim saves the world. And they do do karate at prom. It's I a love it's someone, a good time. And like no, it's a great one you can Depending play. on their age, probably because I think someone's like, What age is it for? It's like, I don't know. Do they do they know what prom is? <laughs> like that's the age. They'll be like, what is this? Like, well, let me explain to you. <laughs> let me explain to you the societal custom that we have in high school. Um, some I love when people sum things up. I love Jordan Patton saying Barfly is a coming of age story, a henchman coming of age story. Someone said this is um, John Hughes Kung Fu movie, and I'm like, I love it. That's the one I'm going with. So we love we love a tight summation. Um, I think first second was making some kind of Scott Pilgrim. Uh, I'll take that. I'll take that too. Uh, sure, it's Scott Pilgrim for the '80s. I don't know. Is that They're all <laughs> folks. Listen, the '90s folks will enjoy. I promise. They're all fun. Like I say, everybody should definitely go check out Kyle's work because he does fantastic stuff. Before we let you get out of here, one final push. Why should everybody go and check out Barfly if they haven't already been sold already? What more can I? Honestly, have I not? I thought it was, if I would have known I had to wait till the end to sell it, I would have sold it so hard at the midpoint. Yeah. Um, here's what I, here, I'll sort of, I'll re-summarize why I think sincerely. One, one, I think if you're familiar with my work, it's more work. I think if you're familiar with Ryan Brown's work, it's more of his work. If you're not familiar with either one of those creators, I say as if I'm not Speaking of myself, like I think you're remiss. That's two really unique voices in comics. Um, there's not a lot of people who do humor well, and I think me and him are two of a handful. Um, so, but outside of that, I think it's a very character-driven story. And I think we love those. Uh, I think if you love superhero stuff, if you love uh, deconstructionist sort of meta superhero stories, which I think we all do, I think you really love the entire minor minor threats universe, including Barfly, which is a fun little romp about a poor little guy who just eats shit all the time and just keeps eating shit, not literally. Well. He is a fly man. I can't speak to that. Um, but, you know, we like to see people, we live an underdog story. Go read, like, read all of them. They're very good. They're very good. Read all comics. I don't think people are reading enough comics. Just go to the store and read some comics. Go on Hoopla. Guys, listen, I'm going to give a secret away. You can read comics for free on Hoopla. Go on Hoopla. It's legal. It's a library app. Read some books for free. And if you like it, guess what you do? Then you go get one because you want to be able to read it again when you're older, but you won't remember the name of it. You already forgot. You wish you had a physical copy. Listen, that's what the store is there for. Go read comics. They're the best. I'm doing okay. My comics are pretty good. But there's a bunch. And we just like, if you read other comics, then maybe you'll read my comic too. On Hoopla. They're on Hoopla. We love it. I don't know what Barfly is. You have to buy Barfly in stores. Lobo comes out next month. It's very good. If you like Peacemaker. If you like Peacemaker, you'll like my Lobo. That's all. I don't, am I stopping? Do I keep going? No, no. That's a good question. <laughs> Do we have to stop? There's more questions. <laughs> no, I think we kind of summed everything up. I, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out to talk with us about this. We we're all big fans of Minor Threats here, and obviously a lot. Of your uh, yeah, we love to see that. that. No, thanks for having me. We love talking. This is it. This is the only way. Like you know, it's just like conventions. Conventions are nice to visit, but this is the only way that we can tell people about things. Um, so so always thanks for having me on. It's good to see Lauren again. She's had me on. So yeah, definitely have to have you back on the comics. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm always down for it. This is there's there's no promotion in comics. There's no promotion in comics. There's literally the stories talking about it and you guys talking about it. So, I mean, that's it. So, and, and you know, your audience is different from the next guy's audience. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks probably some crossover, but you get what I'm saying. So this is it. I'm glad to come on anytime and be what awful, awful experience I was this time in the same way about a different project. So, No, absolutely. I the best. That's exactly right. Thank you, the comic slayer. Good name. Yes. Solid, solid name. Probably a good <laughs> human. I know them. I didn't answer any of the questions. Do they have any in there? Do I need to answer before you guys throw me out? I was going to say, our guy in the chair, do we have anything that we missed? I think he, he threw it up. Oh, Barfly Netflix animated series. Is there animated? I don't think Let, let's ask the real question. Will I get paid if there is one? Here's what I found. <laughs> if there's an opportunity for me to make money on a project, it won't ever happen. Who is the worst dad peacemaker or shit eater? Going back to goods and services. Goods and services, mm -hmm. as he said. Oh, who is the worst <laughs> dad? Uh, peacemaker or shit eater? All right. Who has a worst? Person? I'll say this: the worst person, objectively, is shit eaters. Okay. Yes. Who would you least want to have as a father? I think peacemakers. I think peacemakers because he was kind of saw himself as a father is worse. He's worse. It's a good question. All right. I'm not yeah. going to. They're they're long gone. They're long gone. They're probably dust somewhere. All right. And uh, some uh, Omar asked in the chat too, did you change your mind about NYCC? Uh, he already addressed it. He's not coming. 
too scared. I'm going to do all the big ones next year. I did San Diego this year too. I was like, I wasn't going to do any big ones. I went to San Diego. Never again. No, don't say that. No, it's it's not my, I'd rather do New York. At least I make money in New York. That's my hot take on San Diego Comic Con. Goods and services. Guys, thanks for having me on here. Thanks for talking about minor threats. We love that. Oh, I think that's great. No, I appreciate definitely, it. Definitely, oh, yeah, definitely have to have you back on, especially you know, when you're talking about the Kickstarter. We'll definitely have to have you on and talk yes. about that uh, beginning of the year. So let's already, you know, we'll plan on that if not sooner. My friend. Yeah. All right. It's great. We'd love to hear that too. All right. Definitely. Help out the little guy. Help out the little guy make a little money. Look, because you guys are heroes on your own. You guys are the real heroes here. We're trying. Yeah. Oh, as it says, Ken is the hardest work to manage. Homelander, you guys are something the to think heroes. on. Yes. <laughs> so that being said, wherever you're watching or hearing us talk about this, make sure when you're at the comic shops, go check out the Minor Threats universe. Definitely make sure you check out Barfly and the other stories Kyle does. He does fantastic work. We can sing his praises all night. But listen, just trust me when I say when you see his name on a book, you definitely want to go check it out and go pick up a copy and definitely hand it off to somebody. But we'll just end it like we always do on Turn a Page. On behalf of my team, when you're at the comic shops and you have a great issue in your hands, such as Barfly from Dark Horse Comics, and some of you see somebody struggling to find something, hand yours off to them. Tell them to turn a page. We'll see you next week. Come out. Such waste of time Swiping left and swiping right On people you could know Cause anyone who's worth a damn Be worth way more than a picture could ever show You can find the right light Find the right angle And never find your soul And it can feel like a losing battle And this plot is full of holes This modern way of finding love Just makes me feel so alone And I can't be the only one Sick of staring at my phone So look up Talk to me A better way to spend our energy Just look up Talk to me time fable everyone has just one true love all i know is you're across this table and you're all i'm thinking of so look up talk to me a better way to spend our energy just look up talk to me Swiping left and swiping right on people you could know. Whoa, oh, whoa.